You are listening to Inside the Notes. I'm your host, Erica Block. Here we have the opportunity to listen to the stories that connect our musical family tree. First-hand accounts of performances, musicians, and mentors that shape the way we listen, learn, and teach. On today's episode, we're chatting with San Francisco Symphony second bassoonist, Rob Weir. Thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. It's great to see you and great to hear you and great to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how that beautiful instrument got into your hands? Yeah, crazy, crazy. I mean, um, I was born in this little town in Saskatchewan called Weyburn. No one's ever heard of it. People pass through it on Highway 1 on their way to someplace more interesting. But it was a very, it was a very kind of a cool place to grow up in a certain way because, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, freedom and, and, and safety and, and it was really great. Ideal for a kid in many ways. And we, it was in the heyday of when, when there was a real premium on putting an instrument in kids' hands. You know, making sure that everybody had access to an instrument, and it didn't matter what it was. Um, and so, again, it was really perfect. I came from a, a my mother was a musical side to her family, and I played piano when I was little. So I got into school. My brother was a clarinetist, and and he, he I thought, okay, seventh grade, I have to choose an instrument, so I'll choose the clarinet because it just seemed like an obvious thing to do. I played it for two weeks. I mastered it. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Um, <laughs> But I, I got bored with it because it was like he was a, more advanced than me, and I was, you know, so I was bored. And the, the, our band director, Larry Balog, came in. He had this box, and he opened it up, and in it was this goofy-looking thing all broken into pieces. And he said, this is a bassoon. And he put it together, and he said, does anyone want to play this? And my hand kind of involuntarily shot up, you know, because I thought this is my way out of clarinet life, right? And so he's sure, and it had a plastic reed, and it was pla- it had, the bassoon was plastic, made by Linton. And he sent me home with it, with an instruction book, and that was that was how it all started. And and it was really a you know a meteoric rise in the bassoon world. And I had no competition, so it was really it was really. Perfect. So at what point did somebody say you should probably get a teacher? How did you get well, into the like? I was taking piano lessons at the conservatory in Regina and my, my parents would drive me up the road 72 miles and, and sit outside and wait for us, my brother and I to finish our piano lessons. And, and so they knew there was a bassoon teacher there. His name was Thomas Schuhl. Mm-hmm. And he, he was a really, really lovely man. He was a composer and a bassoonist. He played in the, in the local orchestra. And, and so they started me on lessons with him and and it really, it was, uh, he was very patient and he was the perfect first teacher because he, he was just a complete facilitator. And, and uh, the, the irony here is that for, he went to Temple University for a little while and his teacher at Temple University was the great Bernard Garfield. And he told me at my lessons, he said, now, Robbie, you should listen to this bassoon player named Bernard Garfield. He plays in an orchestra in Philadelphia. And he told me which recordings I should listen to. And so I, you know, hunted through my family's record collection where I went to the local record store in Regina and I picked up a record with Bernie Garfield. Well, I mean, it was amazing to think that at the late seventies, I ended up in Bernie Garfield's studio because of Tom Schudel. That's and and so the richness cool. of that connection was really, really incredible. We had a family, the Lowe family lived in Regina, and we became very friendly. And all these brothers, um, Malcolm Lowe, who was one of them, who was the recent retired yeah. uh, concertmaster of, of Boston, and, yeah. uh, and that family, and, and we were very good friends. I was friends with the, his, his brother, Cameron. And, and I ran into Malcolm at the conservatory one day, and he was coming back fresh off his first half year or so at, at Curtis where he was studying and, and I, you know, we started talking and he said to me, he said, how's the bassoon going? And I said, oh, it's, it's pretty good. And, and he said, uh, he said, you know, you should try and get into the Curtis Institute of Music. And I said, what's that? And he said, it's where I'm going now. And, and he said, uh, he said, and you know what? It's free. And that was like my thing. My dad was studying and that was music to his ears, you know, <laughs> yeah, totally. and so lo and behold, eventually, you know, I got wow. to the age where I was supposed to audition and, and I, I did. And I, 
took my Canada Council Arts grant, which was really like found money, and uh, and that that was that was who I. That's incredible. So, how did you get yeah. prepared for that audition? What was that, that experience? Was, that was crazy because I I spent um uh I spent my high school year my senior year in high school in Regina. I moved up there because I was playing in the in the Regina Symphony at that time. Second bassoon. And and so I got this Canada Council grant thinking that I was going to be able to audition for Curtis that year. Well, they didn't have an opening. So I was kind of spinning my wheels for a year. So I moved out to Vancouver. And that's where I met Chris Millard. And um, and I got an opportunity to play in, in the orchestra regularly. And so it was really a great, another great opportunity for me. Um, it was it was just sort of like another little little time to to just gain a little more knowledge and experience. And then the next year, um, uh, through the help of Robert Creech, who was a horn player in the Vancouver Symphony and had, was was a big mucky muck with the Canada Council, he made sure I got my my grant renewal. And and so I flew down to Philadelphia. There was there was two there were three openings that year, and all three positions wow. were filled by Canadians. Wow! Amazing, incredible. Nadina Mackey, Nadina Mackey Jackson, Michael Hope, and me were the three who went in that, that year. It was crazy. Um, yeah, so that's amazing. Bernie Garfield versus the Canadians. Yeah. So I what, know. Was, what, what, what was your favorite thing about studying with him, especially knowing the legend before you got there and revering his playing? Then you get to sit and listen with him. It was incredible. His his amazing candor and honesty was mm -hmm. really what I needed because I was pretty lazy. Um, the bassoon came to me really e too easily, and that was kind of a curse for me because I have this I did have this lazy side where I wanted to do other things and practicing bored me. And so he he was able to kind of focus what I was. He said to me once, you know, Rob. He said it's just the bassoon, you know? And he said, if you can't accomplish with, you know, all you need to accomplish in one hour's, you know, practice session, you're doing something wrong. He said, just focus yourself for one hour. He has sons. So he knew the psychology behind this. Yes. And, and so, um, yeah, he, he was always super, super um, uh, supportive, but very kind of um, standoffish enough that mm -hmm. that there was never any blur to the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I knew he meant business, and I knew that when those lessons started, and, and that time started with him, that, that you know, it's it's his way or the highway. And and who was I to question mm -hmm. Bernard Garfield? You know, and also the, the idea of what we were speaking about earlier, the legacy idea, is that mm -hmm. he always said to me, you know, he said, you don't you don't want to make me the, your only teacher. He said, you want to get influences from other people because that's what he had done. And he said, it'll make you a unique player. And, and then it'll make you stand out. You know, you won't just be cookie cutter. You won't be like everybody else. So right. all of these things were really, really good pieces of information, you know, to have. And, and to uh, quite often my lessons were scheduled right after a Philly orchestra rehearsal. So he would come tottering up the road and, and sometimes he'd be in a really pissed off mood, you know, because... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about telling tales out of school, but he used to refer to Eugene Ormandy as Shorty, and, and he'd say, <laughs> oh, "Shorty really pissed me off today." You know, Shorty was doing that. Shorty was doing that. Mr. Garfield's still alive, so I hope he doesn't uh, <laughs> get a chuckle out of that anyway. But um, yeah, so so it was. I had that benefit too. It was like you know, like all of us who have these teachers who are really active in their profession, you got it in real time. I I, I had lessons after they had come back from tours. You know, I saw them really, what it was like to, to be the nuts and bolts of being a classical musician and a classical orchestral musician, you know. I mean, it was, and then the school, it set the school itself, of course, you know, I mean, one week it would be de Burgos conducting, the next week it would be Muti conducting, the next week it would be, you know, it was just this cavalcade of superstars, you know, and sometimes we took it for granted. You do when you're 17 or 18 years old. It's that, yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, 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 please. Mom. oh God, <laughs> this week, who is it? Oh, you know, it's like, uh, mm -hmm. but, but for the most part, we, we just were, you know, sitting up like, 
puppy dogs, you know. Just Absolutely. Amazed, you know? Did Did you feel the culture shock going from home to someplace like that? Um, was it an adjustment, or you know, eventually the the positive peer pressure of everyone else working hard kind of makes you sit up and do your job? It was an adjustment. I. It was more more of an adjustment going from. Uh, you know, I, I did have that time in Vancouver to get me used to up to speed on sort of a bigger city life. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a, so much of a shock, but it was it was a sh- it was a big shock going from you know Canada, yeah, to Center City, Philadelphia, and living there and having a life there. That was, but but it was a really good kind of shock. You know, I mm-hmm. wasn't a I wasn't daunted by it. It was sort of like, I, I just, I want to soak up as much of this as I possibly can, you know, culturally, you know, I mm-hmm. loved the ethnicity of the city. I loved, I loved the diversity of the city. It just was so energizing. And, and it was, it was a tough Philadelphia back then. Frank mm-hmm. Rizzo was mayor. Um, there was a real Gestapo like kind of attitude to relations in the community. Um, right. You know, I had African-American friends who, who I would hang out with, you know, at school and and there was always this kind of simmering edginess when right. we would be on the street together and you'd see these vans come by and they would slow down you know and check us out you know and 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 i remember one of my buddies once said you know i said how come they're you know what are they? you know they're kind of cruising along beside us it was at night coming back from a party or something and i said why are they going doing that he said he, he turned to me he said brother believe me it's not for you you know mm-hmm. And, and that, that yeah. was really eye-opening, too, you know, for, for me as, as a kid from a small Canadian town that lacked diversity, really. Um, mm-hmm. So it was, it, was, it was a great experience that way. And, and just, the, just the quality of, of the student body was really, I mean, if you couldn't get pushed by that, you, there was something really wrong with you. Right. You and know. that's maybe not for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What about um, chamber music and things like that? Did you have the opportunity to work with some coaches that really kind of informed you that weren't Bernie? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tony Giuliani was was wonderful. Mason Jones was was fantastic. I played a round of golf with Mason Jones once, and, and he regaled me with all many many stories. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, some string faculty that that you know, would, would be involved if you were playing in a, a Schubert octet or something, you know, yeah. it would be really fantastic. You know, um, I was heavily influenced by the Guarneri Quartet. Um, mm. but one of the first memories I have of entering that building was walking in. I don't know if you've ever been in, in that building, but yeah, you walk up the front steps and the doors open and there's this beautiful grand staircase leading up to the first floor of studios and coming down that staircase, it was like this, phalanx these four gentlemen and it was the Guarneri Quartet and I knew from albums you know I'd seen their faces and I knew that you know they they had their cases and I was literally just (laughs) in awe in heaven like these people really (laughs) exist they're real people you know Michael Tree Sawyer they these are real real people you know Arnold Steinhardt you know I mean it's just like so it was just I was heavily influenced by the personalities in music mm-hmm. and that these were these real people with real lives. It got me listening to, I, I spent hundreds of hours in the listening library at Curtis listening to string quartets, awesome. you know, all of the Beethoven quartets, all of the Bartok quartets, Debussy, Ravel. I mean, I couldn't get enough. And, and so it gave us that legacy, gave me that legacy, not only to the world of bassoon, but to, mm-hmm to the big world of, of music and chamber music and, and the envy I had for that repertoire. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, as we all do as woodland players, you know, we have some, yeah. some tasty things out there, but but the just the volume of it was was just incredible to me. And I think I learned a lot that way too. Absolutely. And to appreciate the size of the universe that you're actually enjoying is yeah. immense. Yeah, yeah. It was I just felt like I felt constantly privileged. To, to be able to to be able to have these people around me and 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 I had been kind of steeped in this in Canada. I had a huge opportunity over four summers from the time I was fourteen for four summers. I played in an orchestra that does not exist anymore in Banff called the Canadian Chamber Orchestra, and it was created 
in the heyday of the Alberta cultural scene, there was a thing they are called the Heritage Fund. And mm -hmm. it was it was what had billions of dollars and it. it was it was set up purely to fund the arts. So the Banff Center was the beneficiary of not only some incredible lead leadership, uh, David Layton, who was the head of the center, who later went on to head the Olympic, uh, one, of, one of the Olympic committees, uh, Neil Armstrong. They're all of these incredible people, brains, that were there tasked with providing all of the, the, the dance people, the musicians, the painters, the sculptors, with the best. And the faculty was incredible. Amazing. I mean, Oscar Peterson led the jazz faculty one year. Um, I played Bartok Violin Concerto, second violin concerto with Zoltan Sekai, who Bartok had written the piece for. I was conducted in the works of Copeland by Aaron Copeland. It Come was on. absolutely amazing to be sitting at a wow. table having dinner and have Oscar Peterson come over and say, hey, do you mind if I sit with you kids? Wow. You know, I mean, it was stuff like that. So, so I... I I, have, I was so lucky as a child, you know, from the time of that age, going right through into, into my Curtis years. And I was only there Absolutely. for two years because Bernie left and I didn't feel like switching teachers. And he said, you need to go and get a job, which eventually I did. So I feel like I've got 15 questions now, but <laughs> what was it like um, working under Aaron Copeland? What was, what was he like as a rehearsing conductor? It was incredible. Again, so nurturing, so humble, wow. so appreciative of these young kids giving his music so much care and attention. And for I know for most of us, I mean, I was from a small town and there were a lot of kids from Toronto. So they, they probably had more exposure to this stuff than me. Mm -hmm. This is really some of my first orchestra exposure. Yeah. Thank God it was a chamber orchestra too. It was, really, it was small. But... Um, yeah, it was it, it was incredible. It was incredible because it was like you know you, you're just you're just blown away by the fact that this is Aaron Copeland, and Absolutely. he's not he's not he's not um, talking down to you. He's collaborative. I remember at one point I played the clanker. I like like a B <laughs> B flat instead of a B natural. So I can't remember the note. <clears throat> I remember his eyesight was pretty bad. He took the score and he goes, he's looking at it. He goes, bassoon. Measure what you mean. He says, what do you have there? He said, I, he said, I know, I'm sorry, Mr. Copeland, I played, you know, whatever the wrong note. He looked at it, he goes, I liked it. <laughs> 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 so it was just that sort of thing, you know. It, it, we're so lucky. We're just so lucky to, to... That's incredible. To have that. I mean, going to, going to recitals, and I sat in the front row in a little auditorium, and Oscar Shumsky, the great Oscar Shumsky, played an unaccompanied recital. The first half was unaccompanied Bach on violin. The second half was unaccompanied Bach on viol. I'm amazing. Amazing. Oh, and uh, you, you know, just, yeah. This kind of fills you up. Yeah, completely, completely. So it was like, there was no, there was no way that I wasn't going to be in music. There was Absolutely. no way because the lifestyle, the people you met, both my age group and then and then uh, Zoltan Sekai, who was ninety years old at the time. You know, yes. like it was yes. everything. This vast ocean of personalities and fun. Absolutely, you know? I feel like that, that encapsulates the whole entire thing. Yeah. personalities and fun. Yeah, and I think as musicians, we all have had those experiences. You know, even whether it was continually throughout our lives as musicians and our know, formative years, we all have the, that. And I think that's what drives, drives us all. Talking about these moments that really kind of just grab you like that recital, um, I wanna fast forward a little bit and just kind of see if we can talk about some concerts where you participated um, that kind of had that same magic feeling where you were it realized that it was extraordinary even in the experiences that you had had. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, I think it, um, my God, there were so many. I, I mean, I was lucky enough to freelance here in San Francisco. My, my wife, future wife, got a, a, a job, a flute job in the ballet orchestra here. And the idea was we would, whoever got the first job, we'd go live there. 
you know, yes. and get married and get married. Yes. And, and thank God it was San Francisco. You know, I mean, boy, did, did I walk <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> so, so we came down here and, and so I freelanced for a while and there were really a lot of great experiences then, you know, and just uh, working with a lot of terrific freelance musicians and, uh, you know, super high quality experiences too. That was lucky. And then I got my job with the orchestra, which was extraordinary to have two people working in two major arts organizations down the street from each other. Again, so lucky, so privileged. So what an awesome thing. And so I, my music director was Herbert Blumstead and, and so many great, great moments with him, particularly in the classical repertoire. You know, so, so he really, he really taught me, he really taught me, you know, how to play Beethoven, how to play Mozart, how to play Brahms, uh, how to play mm -hmm. Bruckner. Um, you know, all the f fundamental parts of being a solid orchestra musician and being super disciplined. He was very demanding, but in a really good way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he was infuriating sometimes in that way because he was just so demanding. But but I appreciated him very much, particularly, it's funny, it's particularly once once he left and came back yearly as our, as our conductor laureate, um, he got he just got better and better and more relaxed and and his his sense of discovery just was expanded so so yeah that that stuck with him and then of course when michael came on board uh, mtt mm -hmm. the whole Mahler experience was i mean every experience with michael was was really fresh and new mm -hmm. and he brought so much that our keeping score series was was such an exciting thing to be a part of because it really was such a deep dive into these pieces and as an educational tool it was really incredible to have that out there in the world you know i think i think that the highlight one of the highlights of my entire career was a Mahler we took we took four Mahler symphonies on tour and, and we were able to, it was a quite a long tour, but we stayed in places for three or four days because we would perform multiple concerts. So I had my family, my wife, Barbara, was playing as an extra flute player on that tour. I was there, of course. My daughter was able to join us uh, from college uh, midway through the tour, and my son was on, on the tour for the entire time. And we stayed in apartments. We, 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 we gave up the, the orchestra hotels and we, we rented apartments and it was unbelievable. And the music making itself, you know, to have my kids sitting at a performance of Mahler 6 in Vienna, have a man sitting beside them and asking them, oh, well, you, this is so good that you're here, you know, and yeah, my parents are sitting up there playing. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and they were so proud, you know, so proud as I was of them for being able to sit, sit through Mahler's six, you know, <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it was really, it was those kind of experiences. Um, and, and that tour was just epic. Michael was on, on, on. He was just so engaged and every night was absolutely electric. You know, it was That's just, so cool. it was incredible. It made you feel, just made you feel good every day to, to go home and, and say, wow, it's really cool being a musica. You know, I mean, it's just amazing, really amazing. So many great performances. Yeah. And, and the, the artists, you. absolutely. I mean, so many highlights, you know, the great artists, you know, performing with Jesse Norman on so many occasions, mm -hmm. um, having to leave the stage uh, during a rehearsal with her because for the birth of my first child, and, and her wow. being so supportive later when she found out, you know, why the people's wife went into labor, you know. It's like, well, bravo. <laughs> you know, that's cool. The, the Cytokinin Orchestra for two summers. You did. Yeah, which was, oh, my God. I mean, talk about that guy. That's like the ultimate. It's like his dream team group, right? I was wow. so lucky. And we did some really cool stuff. He was His health wasn't that great that first summer, but he did manage to to conduct he did uh, yeah it was it was really incredible i mean just being around that guy boy what a yeah what, an what kind of rehearsal what kind of rehearsal experience is it like with him it, it's it's amazing i mean he's he's um he even though he was so he had been very frail and he had come through all that cancer treatment and everything mm -hmm. and, and he had was not doing well but when he started conducting 
it was like he he just sort of came out of the this haze sort of I mean he's never in a haze but he he just kind of it all went away all of that the physical mm-hmm. things just kind of went away and you could just see the transcendence into into the amazing music making and the amazing musician that he has that he is you know and doing these these productions where we I was playing the opera was part of the thing and he was we doing um L'Enfant Sautillage and with some really amazing people. Isabel Leonard was, was one of the, was a soprano star and a couple of those. And it was just really, it was incredible. It was incredible. Mm-hmm. It was really kind of a dream. I had played once under him doing his signature, um, um, there they are, Symphony Fantastique and, and um, in San Francisco. And it was, that was incredible. Also, that's then, pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, really. And then all these years later to do this other repertoire with him was really, it was wow. really fun. That's incredible. And yeah. the, all the colleagues in that orchestra seem to totally love each other yeah, and they're so powerful. There were some really amazing players. I mean, God, that that string section was the first time I heard them. It's like you almost can't believe it, you know, because they're all <laughs> virtuosos, you know. But they all had a that's... sense of how to play in an orchestra. It was really right. phenomenal. And oh, just the stunning. other, you know, uh, Bill, Bill, I got to sit with Bill, you know, Hudgens and his wife. And yeah, everyone around me was just these really, really, really wonderful people and great musicians too. You know, just, wow. All organized by Seiji. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love that entrepreneurial spirit that he had in addition to all of the other things. Um, mm-hmm. But he wanted to do this other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and for his teacher, you know, just yeah. This, yeah. this whole there's a sweetness to that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was just, they were so special. It was really absolutely. special. I kind of feel like it's similar to what Bernie mentioned to you right back at the beginning, that every time you have these kinds of experiences, it's just further informing your entire vocabulary and how yeah. you look at things. And so yeah. getting the chance to have that constantly around yeah. you. Yeah. No, it was great. I mean, and, and then, you know, other kinds of musicians and influences, you know, my wife was always a huge James Taylor fan. And when, when James came to perform <laughs> with us, the previous summer, we, we played for 20 years at a wonderful uh, chamber music festival in Telluride um, called the Telluride Chamber Music Festival. And one day I was hiking the Judd Levy Trail <clears throat> with a friend. And somebody was com- coming toward us, and it was early, early in the morning, kind of a steep part of the trail. And I could tell right away it was James Taylor. So as I went by, I said, good morning, James. Good morning. You know, it was, and that was it. That was the encounter. And so, flip ahead a year, and he's on the front of the stage. So, and my wife was hugely pregnant at that time. And so, I went up to the front of the stage and I said, I introduced myself and I said, uh, So, how was your, how'd your hike end up uh, on Judd Weeby last year? And he looked at me and said, That was you? <laughs> that was you? I said, Yeah. So, I told him why I was there. And then I asked him, I said, Could you, um, I have a big favorite. I said, my wife adores you. She's coming to the concert tonight. Can she meet you backstage? He said, absolutely. Absolutely. So concert comes. She has flowers. She's, like I say, she's just like eight and a half months pregnant. And she's just starry-eyed. And he comes out and knock on the dressing room. There's a lot of people around, you know. And one of the handlers comes over and says, no, no, you can't. You can't disturb him. Right at that moment, the door opens. And James says, okay he said i'm with barbara now and so he takes her he puts his arm around her and she's just saying you know you meant so much to me and he said she said i love you and hearing you at stockridge bridge bowl you know in in the summer of you know 71 and you know all this kind of stuff yeah and and he said i love you too and they had a they had time together you know and so it's like things like that that just you know blow your mind you know know, here's this mensch this this total cool guy you know giving himself. Yeah, you know. absolutely. He and it, he, if, it affects people so much when they hear music of all kinds. And so yeah. when you get to meet someone like that and they, they further it by being so kind, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 That there's so many, so many humans in our, in our business, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was just, just the incredible influences, just never ending. So I'd love to talk a little bit about your audition process to get to San Francisco Mm -hmm. and hearing your early story. um, It just kind of 
triggered in my mind how unique and lucky that you were able to play for Vancouver Symphony and other symphonies even before you went to Curtis. Yeah. Whereas now you 17 and 18 year olds aren't getting to cut their teeth before they go. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a such a difference now. So mm -hmm. what was your actual process like? Was it similar to now? Is there trial weeks? Is there all the same tenure things? Like what what yeah. was what was the experience like? At the time I got the job, I was I had a one year associate principal job in this in San Francisco. Somebody had left the orchestra temporarily, and so I was filling that that position. And I had previously played a one year second bassoon position, so I was lucky. I had a lot of experience with the orchestra, um, and we were on tour in Asia, and then we came back. It was a long tour in Asia, and everybody got sick, including me. And came back, and the audition was the next week or something. And mm -hmm. and I, I, the day of the morning of the audition, I had like 101 fever, 102 fever. Oh my god! I felt horrible. <laughs> but you know, I don't know how I got through. I was able to because of my position in the orchestra, I was able to advance into the semifinal round. So luckily, I didn't have to play a preliminary round. So I played semifinals, and and I don't even remember it because I just felt so bad. I was just kind of on. And I had practiced my butt off during that tour. You know, that was one of the advantages of, of being on the tour is that luckily I had time. You know, I wasn't at home. You know, I mm -hmm. didn't have children around, you know, much to my wife's chagrin. You know, the tour widows always suffer. Yeah. We were talking to friends <laughs> last night in the socially distanced uh, dinner in our backyard <laughs> last night. And we were just saying the, the wives really suffered, especially when they had little kids, because you go gallivanting off for three weeks. But, you know, anyway, exactly. so, yeah, so when I came back and, and so I, I played the first round and I guess it worked out OK. And then and then the next day I was feeling a little bit better. But I always said to to, to kids, you know, well, how do you prepare? And, and I said, I, I basically put myself into a position where I was bulletproof come time. But, you know, the preparation was so enormous and so exacting that it was almost like my body was never going to deceive me because I had trained my body so hard um, mm -hmm. into this unnatural state of an audition. You know, right. there, there was you know, an old an old friend, colleague, Charlie Vernon, who was a bass trombone player in every major orchestra. You know, he never, never, did, he never didn't succeed in an audition. And I said to him, Charlie, he played here for a year and had been in Philly and Boston and North Chicago. I said, once Charlie, I said, what's the key to the success of you in auditions? Yeah. And he goes, well, Rob, I'll tell you. He said, you just imagine your name on the dotted line. And I'm like, okay. Got and it. I thought about that. Imagine yeah. your name on the dotted line. Nobody else could possibly get this job but me. Yeah. And so that was kind of the mindset I was in, not not in not in an egocentric way. It was because I knew I had done the work, mm -hmm. and and it was a little bit hard to be kind of an incumbent because Blumstead was very hard to please, and he we were very different personalities, and he he didn't always like people who were a little bit more carefree, shall mm -hmm. I say? Mm -hmm. uh, he was a little suspicious of that, and he knew me and and what my personality was. And so I was a little bit worried about that. So I, it worked out, it worked out. And and then we didn't have trial weeks. I just was told that day, the job's yours. And so, you know, I had a young daughter and it was like, oh, thank God. You know, this, this, I, I, I grabbed incredible. the brass ring, I was got lucky, you know. And then I just started in that position in the next season. As far as your preparation is concerned, uh, what do you think was the, the main focus was it the infallibility of fingers was it uh, like preparing reads and having reads for days for every situation like kind of how did you go through your pie chart of of necessities yeah well you nailed it on that one it was i decided early on that i wasn't going to try and find the magic read that was going to play every excerpt and i talked to a lot of people about this and i said will a committee be off put if i change reads you know if i put in a different vocal. And pretty much unanimously, people were saying, no, you do what you do to get the job done. That kind of emulates what you do when you're in the orchestra, right? You know, if you're playing, uh, you know, Miraculous Mandarin, you're probably not going to use the same equipment as you do when you're playing, you know, a Mozart uh, octet. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you're as a client, you're going to change your your gear. So, right. so I, I made myself feel better, you know, and realized that no, I'm, I'm, you know, second to soon audition. You're you're asked to do such a wide range of things, literally, that that I felt like it would be really limiting if I didn't have some more things, tools available. Mm-hmm. And that I think was really the difference maker for me. Is that I, I and it gave me this real confidence that you know I knew I could get the job done. <clears throat> um, uh, no matter what part, what what area of the instrument I was having to play in, you know. Right. So that was a big part of the preparation. It was just having the things ready, you know, and making sure up to that day I was ready. But yeah, I mean, I I just uh, I just slammed it, you know. <laughs> I mean, in terms of preparation, and, and yeah. took a very methodical approach. And again, I'm a lazy guy. I'm not a methodical person. I don't play. That mm-hmm. doesn't come naturally to me. Uh, I like to play by feel, and and this was this was a real opportunity to to mine a part of me that I hadn't really really mined that intensely before. You know, when you're in school, it's you know it's, you do to a certain degree, but you know you're running through a lot of repertoire and playing a lot of chamber music, and and they want to try and build at least Bernie wanted to build his students kind of holistically, and mm-hmm. and. You know, definitely setting tasks, but but wanting to kind of make sure all areas were taken care of. And because I was with them for two years, it was a bit of a cram fest trying to trying to get you know as much uh, trying to soak up as much as I possibly could. And two years is so short. So was was he your read? God, like who no, taught you how to make reads? No, because he played he played some different styles of reads too. You know, so he also he, he didn't spend a lot of time with that part of it. Um, he was gone for a little while and, and John Shamley and the contrabassoonist just t- took over for a few lessons with him and he was a real read guy. So he helped me a lot, a lot with that. Um, but I also, you know, maybe a prairie boy, I don't know, I'm pretty good with my hands, you know. So you just liked so it and you... I didn't mind it, you know, it, it wasn't something that I found to be terribly difficult. My first teacher, I remember, said to me, get used to playing on mediocre reads because most of your reads are going to be mediocre. That's beautiful advice. So I've never been an equipment phobe, you know. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I, I try and overcome things just again by massaging it, you know. Yeah, more organically. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Um, do you have a fun story about how you found your bassoon, or are you have you had many bassoons, or have you had the bassoon? I haven't had too many. That my my one of my great regrets in life is that I sold the heckle bassoon that I got new from the factory. It was, I was, uh, I was playing on, on, on a borrowed instrument that was, it was okay, but it wasn't great. And, and it was kind of clear that, that I was getting serious about this thing, you know, mm-hmm. and that it might be a good investment to, to buy a real, bassoon. And this name heckle kept, of course, emerging. Mm-hmm. And so, my parents decided that they would do that. I later paid them back for the instrument, but it was, um, got it from the Heckel factory. It can, I'll never forget the day the box came. It was in this wooden crate and it had, you know, German all over it. And, and it was just amazing. And I opened it up and I remember the smell of the packing material. And then when I got the instrument out, and opened the case and it was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life, you know? Mm. And the smell of that too was just incredible. And, you know, it, it was it was just so unique. And that bassoon, shipping, packed, and the bassoon itself was $4,800, $4,800. That's, That's 1973. Yeah. Wow. 1974. Yeah, I know. Which was, <laughs> so you know, you can put a tree in front of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a few of them almost. Um, yes, you know, so, uh, you know, that was a lot of money at that time, you know, but, but still it was, uh, wow. but, but that was, that was an amazing thing. And I wish I'd kept that instrument. Uh, uh, I play on a Canadian bassoon now that is owned by the symphony, uh, one of Benson Bell's instruments. Wow. Terrific instrument. Um, and, and, uh, but two other of my colleagues in the orchestra also play uh, bell bassoons, and and another my other colleague Steve Bronstein is, is considering getting a bell bassoon. So um, oh, bell section. Yeah, 
but but you know we're, we're the way things are now. I got to admit to you that um, I think I've played my probably my final real concert with the, with the orchestra. We're I'm retiring, wow. um, and my wife is retiring, and we're I'm retiring, and and we just felt it was a good time to to make that decision. Congratulations. Well, I've always been a huge believer because I've done so much work with young people in orchestras, not only in the mm -hmm. youth orchestra here, but internationally. I've just, and I've, I've had the privilege of, of having some really, really star uh, people under my guidance as a, as a coach. And it really dawned on me early on that, that these the opportunities need to be, to be made for the next generation. Yes. And, and so I didn't want to be the kind of person who just kind of hung on to their job forever. That works for some people, but it was never going to work for me. And it doesn't mm -hmm. work for my wife, Barbara. Um, we've had the privilege of having these amazing careers and met all of these amazing people and had great colleagues and, and just had amazing exposure. And it's time to pass it off, you know, to, to somebody else, because I can think of so many kids specifically who I would love to see in these in positions team. in my seat. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's tough times right now, but, but, you know, we have to remain optimistic and assume that things will come back in a recreated fashion of some sort. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, that would be a great joy for me to see, have these opportunities. So yeah, it's just, it's a great time to, great time to. It's beautiful. Pa pass on the torch. Mm -hmm. um, you'll get to, you'll get to enjoy the fun of watching the next generation rise up and Absolutely. you've had some part in that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it gives us an opportunity to, we're, we're planning in retirement to return to Canada. Yeah. So we're, we're excited about this next chapter. It's, it's kind That's, of a leap of literally a leap of faith, you know, so. Absolutely. And well-deserved after such an awesome career. Yeah, That's fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this. This has been sure. so fantastic. Sure. Really appreciate it. Sure. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for joining us on Inside the Notes. Be sure to visit insidethenotes.com for additional content from our artists and guests and click subscribe to stay up to date on future interviews. Until next time, this is your host, Erica Block.